for those who don't know and for anyone who may not know listening to this, could you introduce yourself and say what it is you do? Well, my name is Wade Williams, and uh, I live in Kansas City, Missouri. Uh, I've been in motion picture business uh, for a good many years, uh, both in exhibition and also in distribution of motion pictures, and also produced and directed uh, several motion pictures. So it's consumed quite a you know a long time of my life in in the business, and it's kind of odd living in Kansas City and being a part of the sort of Hollywood business. I always said you know I'm halfway to Hollywood, never quite quite got there, but uh, you know anyway. Getting into your early history. Uh, in 1950, you received a copy of Frank Scully's Behind Flying Saucers. The next year, you saw the Flight uh, Flight to Mars 1950 production. Uh, and uh, per your website, you said that that film changed your life forever. What is it about that time period in the 50s that really fascinates you so much? Well, you know, in the early 50s, I was uh, in grade school. And um, back then, science fiction wasn't... Um, popular. I mean, there had been, you know, science fiction books going clear back into the 30s and even the 20s, pulp fiction and things, but science fiction really wasn't an entertainment uh, medium like it is today and like it has been for 50 or 60 years. I think the thing that all came together when, when I was in grade school was we had the atomic bomb. We went in to the atomic age in the mid-40s, 1945, and uh, in 1949, Russia uh, had the bomb, and the whole country, the whole world was kind of thrust into the atomic age, and everything, you know, was kind of uncertain. We, we were fighting a cold war with Russia. Science fiction in 1950 was talked about a little bit, basically flying saucers, because in 1947, um, Kenneth Arnold was flying his airplane and uh, uh, over the mountain, mountain range back in Washington State, and he uh, radioed into the airport and said he saw some saucer-shaped objects, you know, flying at a high speed. And uh, when he got back to the airport, there were some newspaper reporters there, and they wanted to know what they were. And, you know, back then with the Cold War, they thought, well, maybe it was something from Russia or, you know, something mysterious. And that's where they coined the phrase flying saucers. Well, in, in the same year, there was supposedly in Roswell, New Mexico, there were stories out that, that flying saucers, actually in magazines, and that one of these spacecrafts or two of them had crashed and uh you know a little green men came out of them or were dead and maybe a couple were still alive and that the the government had them so with the atomic bombs and and little green men and and uh things science fiction you know that was kind of the seed where it was getting into the popular culture up to that point, uh, kids my age, uh, young young kids, you know, it was all about Hopalong Cassidy, Roy Rogers, Gene Autry. Everything was pretty much kids stuff with cowboys and guns and horses. Well, in 1950 um, was kind of the pivotal time. Uh, they a movie came out called The Flying Saucer. It was a real cheap, quickly made film. And as they were filming it in 1949, uh, up in Alaska, they didn't know if they were going to have the film to this flying saucers to be from another planet or if they were going to be something, you know, that the Cold War that, that Russia had. And, and you know, the, they decided since Russia had just gotten the bomb, the atomic uh, bomb, that uh, they didn't make these saucer, the saucer extraterrestrial. And that was the very first film dealing with flying saucers released in 1950. It was really an earthbound kind of uh, adventure film. But two pivotal films came out also in 1950. Destination Moon was a George Powell film, which was shot in Technicolor. It was a quite an ambitious film. And uh, it was about the first trip to the moon. You know, they had a lots of publicity, you know, going into it six months or so before it came out. 
But then another producer, a small producer named Robert L. Lippert, who owned a chain of theaters uh, on the West Coast, decided they would make a quick film, also about space travel, and try to get it released prior to Destination Moon so they could capitalize on all the publicity Destination Moon was getting. You know, they started working on it in the late 40s, or, you know, to, to try to get it on the screen in the, in the early 50s. So it had several titles, um, you know, Rocket Ship to the Moon, uh, Rocket to the Moon. And they had some problems with the script. Uh, they were going to use dinosaur footage out of an old movie called One Million B.C. on Mars. And they got the blackballed writer Dalton Trumbo, who was blackballed um, right around that time. He couldn't work in Hollywood because of the Red Scare, and he was dubbed as a communist. But he was one of the finest screenwriters in the business. And he was also anti-war. So they turned over the script to Rocket Ship XM to him, uncredited, and he finished up, up the script. The film came out in uh, Beat Destination Moon by a couple months to the screen. Did extremely well. It was in black and white. And the last sequence when they get on Mars, the film was dyed, the actual film base was dyed kind of a lavender color, a reddish purple. So it gave the whole you know, the whole film kind of a really eerie look, you know, at the end of the movie. I'm not going to tell you a spoiler how the film ends because I hope maybe some, somebody will look it up and take a look at it, but it's quite an effective movie, and it really came together darn well because the music score was by Ferdy Grofay, who wrote the Grand Canyon Suite, was kind of America's symphonic, premier symphonic composer, back in the, in the day and Carl Struess the cinematographer was you know had been photographing films since the silent days and he invented a lens for that picture called the, uh, I don't I don't exactly know the name of the lens but it was to photograph in a small set like a rocket uh, cabin and anyway then uh, that's 1950 the the films that really came out in 1950 were not dealing with extraterrestrials at all. They were dealing with exploring other planets. And at the same time, television had just just started. In 1950, here in Kansas City, we had TV stations just started coming on. And two extremely popular TV shows were Tom Corbett, Space Cadet, and then Space Patrol. And they started in, in the late in late 1950 and went on up to about 1953 at some point. But the science fiction really started the golden age in the movies was 1950. But 1951, the whole science fiction genre changed because with the book Behind the Flying Saucers, it, it came out in 1950 about the creatures from another planet and that we had them and the saucers wrecked in Roswell. They made a movie very quickly called The Man from Planet X. And uh, it was an Edgar Ulmer film who was the director, a B-movie director of Detour. Amazing made Transparent very... Man as well. Yeah, well, yes. <laughs> Sorry, I had to bring it yeah. up. Yeah, <laughs> you had to bring that up. It's not one of his better films, but uh, Detour uh, is one of his finest films. And I think Man from Planet X is probably on a par with it. It was actually filmed on this set of Joan of Arc, which was an Ingrid Bergman film made over at RKO. But at the same time they were filming The Man from Planet X on one soundstage, there was another soundstage that they wouldn't allow anybody on at RKO, and they were filming the movie The Thing from Another World. And they didn't want anyone to know what the thing was or what it looked like. So the very early 50s, they were they were doing that. And then uh, Daryl Zanuck, the head of 20th Century Fox, they they were realizing that science fiction was big business because of Rocket Ship XM and Destination Moon and the extreme popularity that the TV shows were getting, um, wanted to do a film. And so... It ended up being The Day the Earth Stood Still, which was based on a short story. 
in a science fiction pulp magazine. And the thing, you know, was in production and, and then another film that they were making, Walter Mirisch, who was also a West Side Story, made a lot of big films later on and Academy Award winner, made a picture called Flight to Mars, which dealt, of course, with the first supposed flight to Mars. And it was in a two-color, cinecolor process. And that, that came out in November of 1951. And then another really wonderful film that came out, and they're all my favorites that year, was um, a picture based on a 1930s novel called When Worlds Collide, which um, really uh, it was a big technicolor epic, and it was also made by George Powell that made uh, Destination Moon. In fact, both of those pictures got Academy Award nominations for special effects, and I believe probably when Worlds Collide did win one for for that film. But what I guess I'm saying is the advent uh, in the golden age of science fiction, really in the movies and on early television, started in 1950 and really started moving in 1951. And they had four or five big films out in, in less than two years, which were, you know, they played over and over. In those days, you know, a lot of the cities had 20, 30, 40, 50 standalone theaters. And, you know, they would play again and again and again and move them all around. So, you know, they got a lot of, of showtime and, and airtime on in theaters. So that was really the beginning. And, and the next... 1952, they kind of took a breather while all of the pictures they'd made in England got into the business with Spaceways. There was just a, a lot of pictures. Then the studios realized that they had a, a gold mine here, and this really almost destroyed Westerns, you know, completely, because every kid in, the, in my neighborhood went to the dime store, and there was all kinds of merchandising from Tom Corbett's Space Cadet to Space Patrol and then Captain Video came out. So the the real changeover, which got me involved in, in science fiction as a, you know, it was just amazing. It's, it, I mean, you never saw anything like it. And so it really, for my generation, growing up in grade school in the, in the 50s, you know, it, it was like, I guess the kids when Star Wars came out, you know, 30 years later, or 27 years later, you know, it was kind of the same, you know, shock and awe type movies. So that's really how I, I got interested in most of the filmmakers, like Steven Spielberg and a, and a lot of George Lucas and all of these people, you know, in the 50s was really their their seeding of, of all these films and, you know, so every, you know, that that's how it got started, at least, you know, for me. And in your opinion, when did that era, when did that 50s era end to that that era of the sci-fi? Well, it, it, it's actually, it ended, I've answered that question before. The science fiction, the, the glory days, I think, of the first golden age of science fiction in the cinema ended in 1956, with Forbidden Planet, I think that was the for the last really big landmark film made where the studios were involved. But someone asked me one time, "When did the fifties end?" And I thought about it, you know, and I thought, well, you know, it it, it wasn't really when they killed Kennedy. the The whole thing ended, and I thought, and then I just said, well, when Lucy divorced Desi. And uh, more I thought about it, you know, in the 50s, we all grew up with Lucy, I Love Lucy and on TV, every I think every Monday night, and and um, Ozzie and Harriet and, and all of these family shows. And it kind of, who would have ever imagined that Lucy would divorce Desi? And, but going back to uh, science fiction films, and, and I, I really think, you know, after 1956, uh, Roger Corman got in the business, and of course the drive-ins were being built uh, in the 50s quite a lot, and they were making these films 
just overnight, like in three or four days, they wouldn't even have a storyline. They'd get a title and they'd do a poster and then they'd make the film to match. So I think that those type of films, while they're a lot of fun, I think kind of muddied the waters for major studios to stay in the business and, you know, quit investing like lots of money, like in the War of the Worlds and and Forbidden Planet. And really, I don't think it was till 2001 A Space Odyssey that any really serious big science fiction picture was made. I, I could be wrong. I could be missing one or here, but I, it seems to me, you know, the, the whole magic time ended about 1956 in the, the early days of movies in, in the science fiction films, you know, in theaters. Going back to your history, could you talk about receiving your first 35 millimeter projector? Well, going back to 1953, 52, um, after I, in 1951, I saw Flight to Mars. November 13th, I still remember the date. I was 11 to 10 years old. And I saw Flight to Mars in a huge theater downtown Kansas City. And it was so intriguing to me as a child. Science fiction, that, that, that just sort of cemented it. And I remember after the movie was over, we went up to a newsstand up the street, and they had all kinds of comic books. And there was weird science and weird fantasy comic books. And right on the cover were these spaceships like Flight to Mars and... And there was a comic book of Destination Moon and The Man from Planet X, so of course I had to have them. And, you know, that that was, you know, really pivotal. And so I started forcing, my parents were both very busy working, they were, you know, making a living, but my grandparents were retired, so I made them take me to every science fiction picture that played in Kansas City, and there was about maybe 60 theaters all through the Metroplex. So my poor grandmother had to sit through the day the earth stood still. I don't know. I mean, we're going up to 52 and 53. Every time one played somewhere, the thing and the day the earth stood still and rocket ship XM, we had to go. And, and so one day there was a movie called The Robot Monster. And it was playing in a little bitty theater called The Pick. And it, it had on a double bill with the flying saucer, which I had already seen. So we went to it, and afterwards, uh, the manager of the film only, that was the last night, and I asked the guy, I said, uh, could I buy the poster um, out front, you know, from the robot monster? Not that I liked the film, but it had a rocket ship on it, and it, it, it was colorful, and the man said, uh, no, um, we have to send those back to National Screen Service. But that's in Kansas City, and they distribute all the posters uh, for all the movies and all the previews of coming attractions. And, you know, we go down there, and I'm going to give you a lady's name, the branch manager. He says it's about eight floors full of posters. And he said, maybe you call them, maybe they would sell you one. So... I had just become a member, the youngest member of the Kansas City, Missouri Astronomy Club because after seeing these science fiction pictures, I decided I wanted to be, uh, I loved astronomy and I wanted to be one of the first guys that went to the moon and Mars and all that, and like every other kid in those days. So I called up a National Screen and I asked for Miss Hazel Buell, that was her name, and I said, uh, explained to her who I was and that I uh, would like to have some movie posters on uh, the robot monster that I was in the astronomy club and, and I wanted to, to take him over, you know, to the club. And so they said, come on down. So my grandparents took me down there and uh, they were real nice to me. I was like some little kid and they gave me flight to, they sold me for 15 cents, I think. Flight to Mars and two or three other movie posters from, you know, current, fairly current science fiction movies. So that really started my hobby. It started as a hobby, you know, you collect stuff. 
you know, books, dams, kids, butterflies, I don't know, but it, it started sort of the hobby for me. And in the back room back there, they were throwing away trailers. Now, a trailer is a preview of coming attractions, and they were throwing them away by the barrels. And it was 35-millimeter film, sound film, and, oh, they were maybe four to six inches in diameter, maybe three or 400 feet. And there, were, there was a preview in there of Flight to Mars and Rocket Ship XM. They had maybe, when the films first came out, they might have had 75 or 100 of them. And after the films played, they junked them. And they'd only keep three or four in case they, you know, they had later bookings. So I started collecting trailers. So, you know, they asked me, said, anytime you want to come back, come on back down. So well, that was kind of the bad thing to say because I went down there as often as I could get get down there and started getting posters and stills and press books and trailers on all of these films. Of course, the next thing, you've got the trailers, you want to look at them. Well, 35 millimeter projectors were great big. They were six foot tall, they weighed two and 300 pounds and had carbon arcs and 10 year old, 12 year old kid, you didn't have that in your bedroom. So I kept begging my grandfather to go down to Film Row. There was a place here called Film Row and there were a lot of motion picture uh, equipment dealers and they made portable projectors for schools and there was one called a Holmes, H-O-L-M-E-S, and it, it went clear back to the 30s. And my grandfather bought me a used Holmes projector. It was about the size of a suitcase, and you could set it on the edge of your kitchen table and and run a movie on the wall, and it was, you know, 35 millimeters. So that's basically how, how I got started, you know, just collecting this stuff all through grade school. And the same way with feature films, there were big, big warehouse down there. And since Kansas City was right in the center of the country, most of the uh, major studios stored films here, and they could ship them north, south, east, or west. You know, either on the bus or on the, you know, uh, trains. And same with the posters. This is kind of the central hub of the country, so a lot of that film was here and. After films were so many years old, they they didn't need to keep all the copies, so they threw them in the river. So of course I, I made friends with the with the shippers at, at the film depot, and the first film that they were throwing away uh, that I wanted was The Man from Planet X, which I got in 1955, and I still have it. And uh, then Devil Girl from Mars, and then Bride of the Monster, and they were you know, all these B films, they just threw them out. And so that basically with, with that and the previews of coming attractions that I would get down at the other company down the road, you know, I was getting a pretty big collection of films in my mom and dad's basement. And, you know, I was still in grade school and really it's sort of perpetuated, you know, my, not perpetuated, it, it sort of dictated what I wanted to do. Uh, in the future, either own a theater and run films, be an actor in films, or produce and direct films. I didn't quite know what I wanted to do, but you know, I, you know, that's that's where I was headed, and you know, back in, in the fifties. And I think, I think a lot of people in the business and in the industry started out pretty much the same way, as a hobby, and then it kind of works. You know, works into a business, which is great if you can have a business that you can actually make money at and have it your hobby too. I mean, that's kind of the best of both worlds. You did what every internet nerdy person on earth does, which is turn the thing they love into the thing that that financially keeps them stable and make a living well, off it. That, that's a wonderful thing about America. <laughs> Wonderful thing about America, you know, you you can just about do anything if if you're dedicated enough. But I didn't know what future there was in that sort of thing. I I just uh, you know my dad always kind of looked down his nose at at all that stuff. He said, "What are you going to do with all this junk?" 
you know, hell, I didn't know. I wasn't, you know, I was collecting posters and, and science fiction comic books. And uh, then Famous Monsters of Filmland came out. Up at, up at, then I started, you know, of course, buying all that stuff. And, and you know, I had parents and grandparents that pretty well, they weren't wealthy, but, you know, they, I got rid of my Lionel trains and, you know, pretty much read every book there was on on flying saucers. I was just a total nut on flying saucers. I I never saw one. I, I, I kept looking, but I never, I never did see one. You know, I, I guess I've seen these pictures, I don't know how many times, the rocket ship XM50 or 60, and then they all were sold to television um, in the early, mid-50s. Color TV started coming in in the late 50s, so the demand, black and white films were still pretty viable. You know, after they played theaters, um, the owners, uh, the copyright owners or producers of the films or the studios that owned them, you know, they were pretty much played out. Actually, the life of one of these films theatrically in those days was maybe nine months. And that's it. Start playing at the big cities, and then the prints would be booked on out through the small towns and all. You know, all the little theaters. There was just found. There's like thirteen thousand, I believe, movie theaters running in uh, the United continental United States back in nineteen early fifties. And you know, they hadn't started closing yet because you know television wasn't everywhere and hadn't hadn't been around that much. So. You know, there was a, a lot of places where, you know, the movies still, the theaters would still flourish. But uh, I don't know the exact number of theaters, but I believe it was 13,000. Sounds about right. Uh, you joined the U.S. Navy just before Vietnam. Uh, no, I joined, um, I, I went to college for two years and uh, studying business and I, I bought a Corvette, and uh, I, you know, I was running around, partying and drinking, and and not drinking, well, I guess drinking, partying, and going to sock ops and stuff. And I, I wasn't terribly interested in college. Um, I'd have a hell of a time getting to an 8 o'clock class. So finally, I just told, told my dad after two years at, at the University of Missouri that this, you know, I, this is not for me. And I wanted to figure out some way to get in the movie business, but actually, I didn't know how I was going to do it. So, Pasadena Playhouse out in California, they had a, to, in order to get into acting school, you had to go out there to a, like a two month summer term, and they had to say, you, you know, you, you had to spend money and, and stay out in Pasadena and go to the school. And then they would say, okay, we will accept you uh, to a regular term. Well, I thought, you know, my dad didn't want me out of college, but he didn't particularly want me. I'd never been out of out of the state, you know, of Missouri, so he didn't particularly want me to, to go out to California. But I, I did the summer term out there, and I got accepted. I actually was in a they, – they did little playlets, snippets from – shows and I was in Oklahoma and I guess did well enough to where I, I could have gone on and stayed out there but my, my dad said no uh, he's not going to spend the money to put to support me out there and stuff and I didn't know what I was going to do and how to make the money so basically I came back to Kansas City and uh, back then they had the draft and I wasn't in school I didn't particularly want to go in the Army, so I like the Air Force was, you know, jet pilots and all that. Of course, without a college degree, you're not going to be an Air Jet pilot. So, But I joined the Air Force Reserves about two-thirds of the way through basic training. Vietnam broke out, and there's all kinds of rumors that, you know, we're all going to Vietnam and all that, and, well, you know, nothing you could do about it, and... I was a loadmaster on a C-124, which meant, you know, it was a cargo plane and you had to figure out where to put the jeeps and where, where to load everything on the plane because if, if it had a rear ramp, if you didn't load stuff right, the plane wouldn't take off and 
could probably crash. So the problem I had, I wasn't very good at math. So, and you had to have a, they didn't, I guess, it was, I don't know, a soft slide rule or something. I, I could barely figure out where to put everything. So anyway, I, I ended up being a loadmaster. And then at the base, since I operated movie projectors, they always needed somebody to run film, run the films there, instructional films. So I ended up doing that. And when you're away from home and, you know, you'd have to be guards at the at the base at night, you'd have to, like, three hours a night, you, you'd take what they call fire watch. And I remember down in Texas, I, I would walk around, you know, the barracks and other people, they, everybody would guard and make sure nothing was happening and uh, you had a lot of time to look up at the stars and stuff and sort of make some kind of future plans for yourself and at that point I I, I knew I wanted to somehow be in, in the production and movie business I knew very little about it but uh, how to do it but that was basically sort of where I wanted to be and I came home and met a friend of mine that I went to school with and we we decided we'd want to make a movie, and that's, you know, how how it actually I first got started uh, back in the '60s, uh, and we rented a, a 35 millimeter camera and made a film called Terror from the Stars, which was a eighteen thousand dollar flop, and ran out of money before we got it finished, and didn't have any music on it, just had the voice track and. Just, I, we didn't know what we were doing. I, I didn't know what I was doing. And I copied about every movie I'd ever seen. Every every B movie up to that point had a little bit of this, a little bit of that in it. And basically, that's that's how you know how I evolved in, into trying to get into the business. And after you left that, at what point did you get the um, roots rooted down here in Kansas City to where you had the the, the, the mansion with the the theater in it well that that was later i i'm i would you know i, I never left kansas city permanently I, I went stayed in california you know to go to school out there and i met a lot of people out there through connections my mother girlfriend from here was out there and she was robert stack's secretary so i remember when i was out there for the summer i had some walk-ons on the untouchables over at, uh, it was filmed over at the old Selznick Studios, and you know, I, I got around a, a little bit out there and networked. About 1960, about the time I made, uh, my friend and I were making Terror from the Stars, there was a huge mansion here in Kansas City in a Edmore Parkway, which was the largest house in, in the city. A house that was a big Italian Renaissance villa it had an opportunity to rent it and we decided to make a movie in there this terror from the stars it was vacant so you know we when we were writing that script we made uh, you know made the movie in there and then the owners of it it was given to the University of Missouri by uh, Mary Hudson Vandegrift who owned Hudson Oil Company and they wanted to to get rid of it, and it was vacant. And uh, one thing led to another, and uh, the president of the J.C. Nichols, which was a realtor company here, that owned, actually they owned the plaza at that time, made me a deal that the old saying, you can't refuse, and, and sold me the, that house when I was 26 years old. And, you know, my parents were out of town, and they came back, and I was living in a 55-room mansion, and it was, you know, I, I, I didn't have any furniture. So I asked the man, I said, I, I don't know how I'm going to furnish this house, and and how am I, am I going to live here? And he just said, you'll find a way. And so he, he was correct. You know, you, you have to figure out something, so... And basically, you know, I did. So you'd been to California at this point, and what a lot of people, including myself, are saying is, you want to be in the film industry, you want to do all this, why stay in Kansas City? Well, 
first of all, I had no family support in California. I had no, no, um, no really family support there. And back then, it was pretty well a kind of a closed industry to get anywhere because, of course, it was all union out there. There were thousands of, of actors and actresses and people that, you know, wannabes. And I, I was there six or eight months, and I thought, you know, I'm living in the Y up at Pasadena in a, a room about the size of a closet. And uh, I had a Corvette, a 58 Corvette. And I did have some relatives uh, out there that lived quite a ways down, and I would spend the weekends with them. And I just thought, you know, I don't know how I'm going to get anywhere because you had to have an agent, really, back then to even go to, to any kind of tryouts or rehearsals. And I had really no acting training other than a, a little bit of natural experience, I guess. And I thought, well, this, you know, I can't afford to stay out here. You know, I, I, I just can't. And so I came back home and sort of figured out, well, you know, what's next? So, you know, basically, I'm I couldn't get my dad to support me out there. I'm assuming at this point you still had the film collection, or had it been lost at that point? And did you need to re-get? Did you need to recollect at that point? No, I had it all. Mm-hmm. My parents uh, lived in Leewood, and they had a big basement, and I, I had it all stored there. And I, actually, I had a pair. By that time, I'd, I'd had a pair of 35 millimeter carbon arc projectors in the basement with a small screening room. So all of, all of that stuff, you know, was pretty well intact there. You know, I did, a lot of times you lose that stuff, and but I, I was fortunate enough they didn't throw it out when I left. I was about to say my parents threw all my stuff out when I left. So oh, I've heard gotta, I've yeah. heard horror stories like that, yeah. It was worth three thousand dollars. No. Oh, yeah. I know, I know. Yeah. I have friends of the comic collections went south and first Superman comics and stuff like that. It's bad news. Mm-hmm. So you have all of these films, and I, we may be jumping around a little bit at this point, but you have these films still. At what point do you say, "I want to track down the rights to these films to see if I can ascertain well, them"? Okay. The, the film that that had always stuck with me. I mean, I, I loved Invaders from Mars and and War of the Worlds and all those, but there was, you know, that was so remote. I mean, I I just wasn't aware that you could actually own own films. I mean, I, I just it just never occurred to me. You know, I thought the studios owned them and all that, but. In my collection, the film I wanted more than anything was a 35mm print of Rocket Ship XM. Well, the film, uh, the studio that made it, Lippert, went out of business, and they sold uh, all their, about 120 films, uh, to a television distributor, including Rocket Ship XM. And so I thought, well, I mean, I, they must have a negative. Maybe the distributor might have a 35 millimeter print. He would just sell me. So a friend of mine had, worked at a television station, and they had a what you call a BIB book that really had all these movies in it that were available for TV in the day. And they told you who the distributor was. So I found out that the distributor of Rocket Ship XM and Lippert's was a guy named Adrian Weiss at Weiss Global Enterprises out in L.A., and so I wrote him a letter and things, and he said, uh, well, I don't know what we have in the warehouse, but he said, I'm going to be in Kansas City in about a month because I'm I'm selling uh, some of my packages of my films uh, to a couple of the TV stations there, and I'm going to meet with them in person, and maybe I'll, uh, you know, we can meet. I had already moved into this big house, and it was about 1976. He came out, and we met and talked, and I, had, by that time, had a 100-seat screening room in the ballroom there, and it was fixed up pretty nice. And so he said, well, why don't you just 
buy the rights to Rocket Ship XM except the television rights because he says, you know, I don't distribute any of these things anymore in theaters. And back then, 8mm was becoming kind of popular, and some of the uh, studios were licensing their films for, you know, home use 8 millimeter on Castle Films and Super 8. And so I thought, God, well, you know, if I owned the theatrical rights to this, I, I could make new prints and put it back into into movie theaters. So I thought, boy, that's, you know, and, and the 16 millimeter rights also, because there was a lot of companies around the United States that they leased or they would rent films, you know, in 16 millimeter. I mean, you could you could have gone into All Star Pictures here, and they had a whole bunch of old movies, and you'd rent them, and you'd have a party at the house and 16 projector and you know sound and you know run movies at home. So you know a lot of people did that back then, even way before then. There were film collectors uh, that collected films going way back. So. I bought the theatrical and the non-theatrical rights, which meant that I owned the rights to Rocket Ship XM. I could rent them to institutions, schools, or home use, and could put it back into theaters. So, I mean, I was just amazed. My God, I actually own a film that I absolutely loved when I was a kid. I just... Then you know, I just couldn't imagine that you could own one, and so there wasn't any prints. They only had a negative, and the negative was at Warner Brothers, and the negative was in nitrate cellulose, and nitrate is a highly inflammable film base. It burns like black powder if it catches fire, and a lot of that stuff deteriorated. That's why there's a lot of films that. There's really no good 35 millimeter material on anymore because it wasn't it wasn't preserved. So I made a new print of Rocket Ship XM in 35 millimeter. It was the first safety film print that had been made. Now safety film was made on an acetate, not a nitrate base, but an acetate base, which didn't didn't uh, catch fire. It was completely safe. I wanted a, a friend of mine who worked at Warner Brothers. I had gone out there a couple of times out in Burbank. The director's son, the director of Rocket Ship XM, was deceased, Kurt Newman. But his son was on the set, and his son was a producer at Warner's. So I was, I, you know, I was, I was trying to get all the information I could on the making of the movie and maybe where the model rockets were and all of that and. And uh, so I did get a hold of Kurt Newman Jr. and told him that I had made a new print. And he said, well, well I'll tell you, Wade, why don't you come out? And uh, next time you come out, bring the print. I'd love to see it again. And I'll arrange in the big theater here at Warner Brothers. We'll have a, a private screening. And we'll, you know, I'll ask a few people over that, you know, are into, into science fiction that have heard of the film that maybe have only seen it on television. So... Uh, in the meantime, I had been fortunate enough to a friend to meet the leading lady that starred in Rocket Ship XM. Her name was Osa Masson, and uh, she was from Sweden or Norway, and she she lived out there. And she was actually taught philosophy at uh, UCLA, and she's a very smart lady. And I invited her, and uh, the other people that showed up uh, were other people involved in science fiction, and uh, Dennis Murin, who was working with Spielberg, and and just a lot of these, you know, various people. Now, this is in the 70s. So we ran Rocket Ship X7. It was just pristine, and everybody, in fact, the whole film had always been flawed because when they made the movie, they made a miniature spaceship that looked nothing like a V-2 rocket. But the producer that owned the studio, Robert Lippert, had an association at White Sands Missile Base with the base commander. So the base commander sent him about an hour and a half worth of films of V-2 rockets being launched there at White Sands in color and in black and white. 
So he thought, this is a treasure trove. I can just splice them into all these movies I'm making, which, of course, he did. And he wasn't the only one, a special effects guy, a real low-rent special effects guy, but he's very good. Jack Rabin, he used V-2 rockets everywhere, but they were nothing but, you know, the German V-2 rockets are about 40 feet tall and shot them all up at White Sands. Well, the bad problem when you saw Rocket Ship XM on a huge screen or even on TV, the first, when they launched the ship, here comes this miniature ship that's totally different coming up at the camera. Then they have a secondary shot straight on. It's a different rocket. It's not even, it's got paint on it. It didn't even, I, I thought, what in the hell is going on here? I mean, this, something's wrong, but, you know. And they were not going to add any more shots of the exterior other than the one shot of the ship coming up at the camera. So Dennis Murin and Bob Burns, actually Forey Ackerman, was there from Famous Monsters, I believe. And they all thought, what a shame. The direct And the, the man, the director's son said, my dad was so mad. He, you know, his, the, the guy that directed Rocket Ship XM, uh, Kurt Newman, Senior was an amateur astronomer and, and, you know, loved the genre. And they were all mad, but the man that produced the movie and owned it, Robert Lippert, he had the last say. So he said, you know, it was embarrassing. He just had to kind of ignore it. It's like, well, what's going on here? So I believe it was uh, Dennis Murin said, why don't we make a new rocket that looks like the one in the movie and replace the V2s? So it's not, it just doesn't look so bad when when the ship takes off. And so then we all had a discussion. We were eating lunch there. Dennis Murin said, uh, I'll do it for free. Uh, I'll, we'll build the stuff for free. And then a couple of the other guys, Tom Sherman and, uh, oh, I forget, I don't have their names in front of me. They were all, you know, heavily in the business. And uh, they were all super fans of that movie and so we all decided okay let's do it and then i'll pay for it and then bob burns and kathy burns who are big science fiction collectors and fans out in burbank um, they said well um we'll scout the locations we'll find out and from kurt jr exactly where they shot all this footage up in up in the high desert, and so everybody put it together, and from stills from the movie, they recreated, you know, the spacesuits, which were nothing but World War II oxygen masks and caps and stuff on Mars. There was another fan named Irving Lipscomb, and he lived back east, and so we invited him. So my, we had to shoot some footage with actors playing those five people on Mars because there had to be a... We couldn't cut the soundtrack. We had to leave the soundtrack alone when the when the, the V2 rocket footage was put in. But we had to match some footage, you know, with actual actors that looked from a long shot that looked like uh, uh, the actors in the movie. So I luckily got to be in my favorite movie. I played Lloyd Bridges. And my two associates here in Kansas City in the movie business, they they played two of the other characters, and we had a, a lady play Osa Masson. And you know, we went out into the desert and spent a whole day, and and they built uh, models. We did a four grand miniature of the ship, and pretty well matched all the old footage. You know, then we out at Howard Hughes had an old laboratory out there, a film lab, and they made. Uh, some of the ships oh, with the uh, blowtorch in the back of it, zooming by the camera. And so, you know, I had an Academy Award crew redo all that footage. So we had the original film. We never touched the negative. The old negative is still exactly intact. And, you know, you can, all the 16 millimeter prints that are floating around, and actually the 35s are the original. But when we released it on VHS, we edited in all the new footage, or they did it out in California. So the film on the edited footage and the, and the new rocket, it is very smooth and very slick. 
And it's really the director's cut. That's the way the director wanted the movie. But unfortunately, it's there's so many collectors and fidgety, fussy collectors. If you change anything or do anything to one of those films, you get lambasted in blogs and print and and uh you had no business doing this who do you think you are and all and uh, you know i put up with that a couple times on several films but i got a lot of wonderful praise and then a lot not a lot but a few people you know they i, I don't know why they just they tried to find any reason not not to give you any credit for doing it i really wasn't looking for credit i just wanted the film people stop making fun of it when it was shown because it's a really masterfully made film and and at the time you have to look at it in 1950s eyes you can't look at it today with all the computer animation but the film dramatically you know it's very stylish and and you know to me and the music score is probably one of the best music scores for a science fiction film, in my opinion. I mean, I love Star Wars and all, and, and a lot of the new music, but Rocket Ship XM score is uh, quite uplifting. So that's sort of my my involvement with Rocket Ship XM. Do you think that the, the advent of Star Wars coming out the prior year made people more interested in, in things like Rocket Ship XM and made them more interested in wanting to work on the project to improve the film? No, you mean Dennis Murin and those guys? No, they were they were they were more from the earlier fandom, the very first decade in the fifties of. I mean, that's what interested all. It got all these guys interested in doing science fiction from. Bob Burns and 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 Kathy, uh, they went to Hollywood in the late '40s, and they were on the set of Unknown Island, where dinosaurs were walking around in rubber suits and falling over <laughs> dead and stuff. So it, it's really we all grew up in from grade school, very impressionable when you're very young, and you go to a theater, and you, the experience is lost today, um, and a lot of well, especially the appreciation for the black and white films, because you know you you go into a theater and you look at the movie The Thing from Another World on a sixty foot screen or fifty foot screen in black and white. It is as scary as can be, and so is Invasion of the Body Snatchers and all of these films. The War of the Worlds they take on a completely different look in a in a in a theater where you have a shared experience with an audience. And I mean, some of them are corny. Some of the dialogue, it wasn't corny then. I mean, it's, you know, through the years, it's become a little corny here and there. But, you know, that, that's what gives these films their charm. And, you know, you better not touch them. You better not mess. I learned you better not mess with them because you're going to get a lot of flack. And, uh, I, I, you know. At what point did you meet the Mossman brothers? That would have been uh, night. 1977, um, they're, they're twins. They came down here from uh, Iowa. They're six brothers, and they were uh, uh, going to DeVry, a technical school, and they were studying computers. They were the very first classes where, you know, you were getting careers in computer science. Oddly enough, I was driving a 1941 Cadillac with you know, all the chrome and all. And they were working at a service station down the street from where I lived. And I didn't know they were identical twins. And I'd go in and get gas. And one of them would come up, morse the windows, and they just flipped out over the car. And then another one would come. And uh, the next time I was down there and back and forth. And then I guess the owner of the station said that I, I had this huge um, mansion up the street. And you know, they were looking for part-time work. I said, um, you know, I'd run movies up there every Sunday night, and all the neighbors would come over, and I'd have 50 and 60 people, and I'd have to run the projectors. So I thought, well, can you guys run movie projectors? And lo and behold, in the small town of Spirit Lake, Iowa, where they were from, they operated the projectors in the little theater up there called the Royal. So I said, well, wow, 
um, okay, I'll, I'll pay you to run the projectors on Sunday night. Well, they came over and, and I could set out with the guests and watch the movies and, you know, they started running the machines and, you know, you never locked your doors or anything. And I'd come home some evenings and they'd be over there running a movie up in the screening room. And I, I guess I had 150 or more pictures and they ended up running every one of the films and were just totally enamored with with movies i guess they always had been and it was their desire and i always thought would it it'd be a lot of fun to own a movie theater you know somewhere and of course a lot of the theaters then had closed the single screen theaters and they were doing uh multiplexes and fourplexes and sixplexes and shopping malls and so uh, there was a theater here in Kansas City in Fairway, and it was it was called Fine Arts, and it was going out of business. They were putting a Wolferman's restaurant in there. The lady that ran it was a good friend of mine, Denise Putra, and she had come down here from Minneapolis to manage that theater. And we all thought, you know, we all like movies, so... Maybe we should all go together, the the Mossman brothers and Denise and myself, and maybe try to find a closed theater and reopen it and run classic films so that everybody was enthralled. The Mossmans didn't have a lot of money, but Denise and I did. Not a lot, but we had enough money to... They, did, they were the worker bees, and we were the planners and plotters and... And you know, setting up the business end, and that's really how we all, you know, became involved in the business together. We opened the um, old uh, Dickinson Theater, which was in Mission, Kansas, right off the uh, uh, plaza there, and we're running classics. And we were there about twenty, twenty, twenty-two years, and and then moved on to other, you know, other theaters and made movies along the way. I miss the Dickens. I live behind the old uh, Mission Theater, actually. So, uh, I miss it. Was it operating uh, at that time? When I moved in, Probably no. Not. no. It, was, it was closed by 2006, I think. Yeah. Because I used yeah. to do theater there, and they were, they were showing, but they were showing, like, second-tier A pictures at that point, so. Well, we might have been there. I forgot when we closed it. Uh, we were running uh, The Gods Must Be Crazy. Finally, um, when when VHS came out and block, you know, they started putting blockbusters all over, the desire to see classic films really went down, and especially cable, you know, with Turner Classics and AMC, the uniqueness of running the old films sort of died, and so we were running the first run art films. In fact, we hold the record there, I think, for God's Must Be Crazy. We played two years that one theater, and we had Waiting for Guffman for a very long time. So we changed the theater over to art art films before the owners of the theater. Um, actually, they raised the rent so high, they wanted to take the theater over. So we took off and you know went into another venue. And was that the beginning of Englewood Entertainment Home Video? Um, that was in 1992, yeah, pretty a little much. bit later. Yeah. Okay. Um, in, uh, I believe it was 78, uh, the Medved Brothers published the Gold Turkey Awards, and the prior year they published the 50 Worst Movies of All Time. How did that right. affect the v your view on, on the value of the films you were distributing? Well, I didn't own that many films back then, um. I, I I was distributing them through Starlog Magazine, my friend, the editor in New York, and I was uh, very good friends with them and supplying them a lot of stuff. And they were selling my first my VHS business. They were they were selling them first in Starlog, and I had had a print of Plan Nine from Outer Space and Bride of the Monster clear back when they threw them out in the fifties, and I just really thought they were both just pretty lame I don't know why I gave them away to somebody back then Prince and you know I knew of them but I, I just I I just couldn't believe how 
how ridiculous Plan 9 from Outer Space was. And then when the Medved book came out, I was licensing films, film clips to Paramount and, and some of the major studios. They were using them in other films. And a guy named Harry Medved called, and he had he and his brother Michael had worked on those two books, and they wanted uh, they were doing a film with Jeff Stein, who was a producer of The Kids Are All Right. They were they were doing a, a show called It Came from Hollywood, and uh, it was they wanted to use Ed Wood clips, and and they had a whole list of films they wanted to use clips from. I owned a few of them. But then they said uh, they didn't have anybody to do the licensing and the tracking down of the owners, and I knew pretty much where a lot of you know where the producers were to a bunch of them or who owned them. So I said, well, I'll go ahead and license them. I'll, you know, I'll just work for Paramount and I'll I will license them, and, and you know you can license the stuff for me. Well, you know, I started talking to various producers that own these films, and I discovered that I could buy the whole rights to the films copyrights the whole nine yards cheaper than I could buy a clip from it. A lot of the films had been distributed by two or three other companies, so the chains of titles were just all over the place. And it was kind of a sleuthing effort to to find out who actually owned them. And like Plan 9 from Outer Space, I had to buy from five or six different people you know, before I ended up being able to, to get the copyrights. You know, same with the other Ed Woods. Uh, uh, they were pretty well worthless until those books came out, and and those books just put Ed Wood on the map. Unfortunately, he died a couple of years before. You know, those books came out, and so I thought, well, you know, I'm going to buy these films. I guess the second film I bought, and actually going back to '77, one of my other favorite films was Invaders from Mars. I had seen it in 1953 when it was brand new, and I uh, had an opportunity. It was released by 20th Century Fox, but they didn't own the movie. A man named Eddie Alperson owned it, and his son made a bunch of uh, independent films, and 20th Century Fox did the distribution. So they had sold it. I got a hold of uh, the producer, but he had sold it to the Victor Corporation, and then the Victor Corporation had sold it to a man named, had sold the library to a man named Richard Rosenfeld. So in 1976, I went to Rosenfeld, who was in London, and I said, I'd like to buy the rights to Invaders from Mars. So he sold me all the rights worldwide in perpetuity, with the exception of United States television, because all those old films had really no theatrical value anymore because they had all played through theaters and they the only times that they were ever run again you know on kid shows or something and the rental was 15 bucks so you know a film after it was a year too old on those b-movies was pretty well worthless except for television syndication and television stations would buy you know would maybe pay 250 or 300 bucks a picture for a three or four year license and they would get a 16 millimeter print and they could play it as many times as they wanted so I was able to buy the rights to most of these B movies in black and white fairly reasonably because there wasn't any demand for them and they'd already played out theatrically pretty much and so I thought you know I had the extra money I made a list of all of the science fiction films from 1940s to up to 60 something and that were not owned by major studios and I started after I I bought a couple of the Ed Wood films I started sleuthing them out and trying to find out who owned them and a lot of times TV distributors like NTA had some of them they had flight to Mars and I was able to buy most of the rights, except most of them, like they wouldn't sell you television first because there was still a viable, you know, sales for TV because, you know, there was still black and white and uh, you know, the TV stations would still buy black and white. That's the problem. The last 20 years, why a lot of this stuff, you know, other than Ted Turner or Turner Classic Movies, uh, you do, there's just not 
many buyers for black and white films and that's why a lot of my films are not on TV not the fact that I don't want them on it's just there's so many films available today in color and you know a lot better special effects and a more modern format so the early science fiction pictures are fairly you know difficult except the thing and the day the earth stood still and you know the the big ones uh, that are owned by major studios are sold in packages, and you know they're still still all over the place. But um, that's how I was able to amass quite a big library. And same with the television series Tom Corbett's Space Cadet, and also Space Patrol, and the series Tales of Tomorrow, which is about seventy half-hour shows made in the early 50s. It was kind of an early twilight zone. It had major stars from James Dean to Paul Newman and Joanne Woodward and Veronica Lake and old stars and new stars. They made them live in New York and they were all written by top science fiction writers. And I was I saw that when I was a little kid on the late show and I ended up tracking that down and buying all of those. And, uh, you know, it's just Nobody wanted them at the time that I I was out buying them, and my father was a kind of a big critic. He said, well, "You know, what do you want with all that old black and white stuff? Nobody wants to see it." And, you know, he was right for a long time there. He, you know, who's going to spend any money for a standing she monster? You know, or Beast of Yucca Flats? But if you if you own a bunch of them and you sell the whole kind of the whole library, you know, in, a, in one license steel, then, you know, they're out and being being exhibited. You brought up Invaders from Mars. Now, in 1986, Canon Films remade Invaders from Mars with Toby Hooper directing. You yes. obviously sold, you obviously gave them permission to do that for a price, and you were listed as associate producer of the film. How, what did the role of associate producer entail, and how did that project come about? I had become friends with the original uh, son of the producer, Eddie Alperson Jr. Because when I originally bought the rights to Invaders from Mars, the negative was gone on the 1953 release. A year later, they cut the cut the last reel off and reshot it, and it was a different version. So I got a hold of Eddie Alperson Jr., who was also involved in the original one, and they had some original Cinecolor prints which I had to use to make a restoration. So Eddie and I were, were, you know, pretty good friends. He lived out in California. And uh, his stepmother and him owned the remake rights to Invaders from Mars. Now, his stepmother was, of course, her dad was dead, and the stepmother had moved on. And she wouldn't talk to Eddie Jr., so... And he said, why don't you go buy her half of her rights or buy her rights out to Invaders from Mars and we'll try to shop it around uh, and maybe try to get a remake on it. So I got a hold of, of his ex-wife and she was, and he, she wanted money. And so, you know, she she sold me the remake, her interest in the remake rights to Invaders from Mars. And of course, Eddie Alperson Jr., who was the associate producer on it, he owned half of it. So between both of us, we owned the remake rights of Invaders from Mars. There had been a couple of inquiries uh, through my agent in California. It's a David Gersh company. It's a literary and motion picture agency in Beverly, uh, Beverly Hills out there. And they they represented me for many years. And so Toby Hooper wanted to remake it. And he had the usual suspects out there, Bob Burns and all the people. I mean, Invaders from Mars is a highly coveted film. It was a film that Steven Spielberg uh, mentions in some of his writings as being quite influential uh, in his being interested in the genre. He saw it on on television back in where I guess he was grew up in Arizona. Um, so my agent said, and Eddie, Eddie said, well, you know, we're not going to sell it unless we're associate producers. Well, you know, you don't go in and you tell Toby Hooper 
or them what to do with a the movie, they pay you quite a lot of money. I mean, into the hundreds of thousands to do a remake of a picture of that stature. So I wasn't about to, you know, to go in and stick my nose in it and tell them what to do. Anyway, it was remade contractually. Eddie and I were associate producers and were on the posters and all that. But really, other than talking to the writers a few times and being sort of a consultant along with Eddie, you know, on the picture, um, I didn't have much much to do with it. I, I didn't go out there uh, like I did later on when we were film when they were filming Ed Wood with Johnny Depp. I was out there, but uh, you know they went ahead and made it. Unfortunately, most remakes are not as good, or at least in people's eyes, as the original. And when I saw the remake, I mean they spared no expense at the time. They spent a lot of money. Um, I didn't think it was as bad as some of the reviews because I just thought it was fairly well made and had a, a great design. It had a, you know, everybody would try to compare it to the original, and it's just difficult to do. And looking at it again after all these years, I just looked at it not long ago, the remake, um, it looked better to me today than when I saw it at the premiere. So basically, that that's really my claim to fame on, on the remake of Invaders. There's some more interest in it now to remake it again. And I've seen some production designs they've sent me. But I don't want to remake it. And, you know, somebody hopefully will, a uh, major studio or player will come along and, and want to want another license to remake it. And that will be fine. It's, they make some of those films. I don't know how many times they made The Thing. Um, no, not The Thing. Invasion of the Body Snatchers. I love. I, I came very close to owning Invasion of the Body Snatchers. Uh, it was owned by National Telefilms Association. And I just didn't... They wanted, at that time, when they were going out of business, uh, before any of those remakes, when black and whites weren't worth a lot of money. They they wanted $50,000 for the copyrights and all. And, man, I just didn't have it. And that was, I should have robbed a bank <laughs> and bought it. But, you know, you you can't, can't get them all. So, but I love the film. It's, uh, I think Invasion of the Body Snatch is one of the finest science fiction films made. I think Curse of the Demon is an awfully scary one. Um, in that, in the more horror genre than actual uh, hardware, and um, Day of the Earth stood still to me is probably the Citizen Kane of all of them, no matter what. Uh, as I, I had lots of conversations, not lots, but long conversations personally with Robert Wise about that film, and and uh, you know nobody knew that it, where they got you know you know where they got the plot of the movie, don't you? On day, day there stood still. Turning Josh Brain on. I should know off the top of my head, but I don't. It's been a long time. The Bible. It's the Bible. Bible. A man comes down from heaven. He gives he gives an ultimatum. He is killed by Judas, and he's resurrected. That's what Robert Wise finally, when it, it played television in the early 60s, um, I think it had to be 10 years old before it would, they would... Uh, Fox could sell those packages to TV, and about 61 or two, I remember, uh, on an interview with Robert Wise, and, you know, he he was talking about it then, and then I asked him about it uh, in, when I was in California at a, a conference out there, and, and he said, yeah, they just didn't say anything about it at the time. <laughs> You you brought up Ed well, before we get into detour and then we'll move on to mystery science. You mentioned the Universal Ed Wood film. How did that project come about? The 1994 Ed Wood. Well, first of all, I had by that time bought as many of the Ed Wood films as I I could buy. Um, I got By the Monster, Plan Nine, uh, Night of the Ghouls, which was uh, under the title Revenge of the Dead. Actually, it was never released. Jailbait I bought. I bought a whole bunch of films from 
a distributor named Halco in in the in Charlotte, North Carolina. They owned that film and oh, Brain from Planet Eros and Teenage Monster and Thunder in Carolina. They went out of business, and I bought their copyrights to those films. And so I owned some of the Ed Woods, but I Glenn or Glenda was owned by Paramount. Warren Beatty wanted to uh, buy the rights to the old one, reissue it, which they did. And then he wanted to remake it, and he had a falling out with Paramount. Paramount was supposed to pay George Weiss, the original producer, another 30000 bucks, I think, for the rights. And they dropped it because they, they didn't care about it. So the rights, uh, Paramount renewed the copyright, of course, and then uh, they didn't care about investing any more money in the remake or the rights to the picture. So I ended up buying it from the George Weiss estate, you know, the guy that originally made it in 1953. Uh, Sinister Urge uh, was a headliner film. I had, I had a print of it. I just never watched it. And uh, Greg Luce at Sinister Cinema, when I was buying these, he was desperate to get Ed Wood films. And he got a hold of headliner productions out, I think, at Malibu out there. They had a little office. They were making drive-in movies, and he bought um, Violent Years and uh, Sinister Urge from them, and was releasing, you know, the Ed Woods on on his Sinister Cinemas label. And oh, about t- two years ago, he he said, "Call me." So, Wade, do you do you you got the other Ed Woods? Um, why don't you buy these from me? And so I, you know, he made a deal that. I thought, well, I've got the others, um, you know, why not? So I I ended up with seven of the Ed Wood films, and then I've got Crossroad Avengers and um, a couple of the short, the other TV thing he did, I I can't remember the name of it. And then there's a couple of uh, the Plan 9 Companion, which I was associate producer of uh, with the late Mark Carducci, it's called, I think, Flying Saucers Over Hollywood. And then I've just done a deal with uh, Brett Thompson. I was involved in The Haunted World of Ed Wood. And I'm going to end up with the rights to that because, you know, if you have the whole Ed Wood early library, you know, all of those are kind of valuable because they they have people, you know, that were interviewed while they were still living from a lot of the Ed Wood films. So, you know, they're kind of documentaries, and they were, they were always released. Various licenses from Nostalgia Merchants to uh, license to real movies, Nostalgia Merchants. Uh, oh, God, I can't even know. I've got all the bo- video boxes here, Englewood Entertainment, which was our company. And, I, you know, I've got a, a lot. Of, I've got Ed Wood's, quote, finest hours, basically. But um, I, I guess I got way off track on, on Ed Wood. Um, Disney was going to do um, the, the, uh, Rudy Gray wrote Nightmare and Ecstasy. He called me and he said, you know, uh, Disney's interested in making this movie. They want to buy the rights to reproduce Bride of the Monster and, and reshoot some of that footage. I said, great. And so I just turned him over to my agent in California. And, you know, they made the deal with... Uh, Disney. Well, then Disney dropped the property, and I didn't think it was going to go anywhere. And then, oh, God, six or eight months later, the agent called me, and he said, yeah, I guess Universal or whoever made it has picked up the film. They bought the rights to reproduce Plan 9 and and Bride of the Monster. I was out there when they were uh, shooting the Bride of the Monster scenes, which I, it was kind of weird because they shot them in a, a warehouse, you know, down by the beach, and I thought, you know, I, I thought they were going to be doing it in a major studio, but they they, they shot uh, the Bride of the Monster stuff, you know, down in a, a just an old warehouse, and you know, Sarah Jessica Parker, and they were all there, and Johnny Depp, he was a very nice guy. What did you think of the movie when it came out? I thought it was absolutely fantastic. I think it it's one of the finest kind of biopics on Hollywood and I think it's a very sad movie a lot of people I guess think maybe it's funny but I I think it's an indictment really of 
how desperate people can be to get in that business and how desperate things go. I mean, I I, just, I was very sad when it was over because I, you know, I knew a lot of those people. I I'm, I knew very well um, Dolores Fuller, and you know, and, and all of them except I never met Ed Wood. Met everybody else, and spent. In fact, Dolores was back here for one of our festivals, and uh, I just thought uh, I it, I thought you know this is the blind leading the helpless, but. I just thought it was kind of a sad story on wannabes that had, you know, everybody calls Ed Wood a genius and all that. And I I don't think he was a genius. I just don't think he had anything else to do. That's all he knew how to do. And I, I you know, from, I, I knew the uh, Reverend Lemons, one, one of the, um, producers play a nine and and you know it was his take on it too he said you know ed would tell anybody anything uh it was any means to an end i i don't know i just i just thought that that underbelly of hollywood i thought it was kind of sad i i just don't think they they had a life i was to understand that that ed was pretty much inebriated most of the time and and was depressed a lot and it just I, I can see living out there and, and it costs so much to live and there's so many people and to, to try to get ahead unless you're born into the business or you're phenomenally talented I, I think it's very difficult you know back then it was very I, I do have to hand it to him it's very difficult to make a film in 35 millimeter and get all the post production done and and get it released and make posters and trailers and you know it costs a lot of money to make a film i've made three and 35 millimeter and it costs a lot of money and you know i have to hand it hand it to him hook or crook you know he did get it made i i don't think he had the intelligence i would i want to say technical intelligence or science intelligence to make pl- a movie like Plan 9 from Outer Space. I, he was into Bela Lugosi and horror films and stuff. He grew up in those films in the 30s. And, you know, I, I think the reason he made the Plan 9 because science fiction was very big. And, you know, that, that's originally the title was Grave Robbers from Outer Space. That's what's on the script. And, you know, I just, I, I, I don't know. I, I just thought I, the Johnny Depp film was just sensational, and and it, I just I was well made, and and everybody was great in it. And the guy that played Bela Lugosi, uh, I, I never Landau. knew Bela. Yeah, I, I knew Bela Jr., who's an attorney out there. It looks a lot like his dad, and I, I just thought the movie was brilliant, and. And he, I know you don't hear much of it anymore, but I guess because it was black and white. I'm glad it was black and white. Um, in 1992, you uh, started to or directed a remake of Detour, and ultimately it did not get released due to the larger budgeted studio remake at the time. Can you uh, explain your desire to do that? And Well, um, I, have, I was doing, I was out in Hollywood, I was doing post production on a film called Midnight Movie Massacre which we changed the title to Attack from Mars for a reissue of it, and we made it in 35mm, and it, cost, it was my most expensive movie. It cost like $350,000, and I had investors, and it was fraught with nothing but problems. I, I had a crew from L.A. come in, and and actually Joseph von Sternberg's son, grandson was a cinematographer, and I had a director that, uh, I just didn't think knew the genre, and uh, we basically had to start over and write a wrapper around it and reshoot a bunch of stuff. And I hired a different director, and we finally got it made and did post production. But while I was out in Hollywood, actually, the guy that did my post production was a man named Herbert L. Strock. He did Gog, Riders to the Stars. He worked with. Um, I led three lives, Jack Webb, and actually he was one of the assistant editors when he first got to Hollywood on 
Wizard of Oz, and he was an older gentleman. He was probably in his 70s or 60s when he had all my post-production, and he was still using a moviola uh, in his business out there doing the editing. But the guy was absolutely brilliant. He, he could take a film that wasn't even watchable and, and make it watchable. And he was really a, a, an excellent guy and a lot of, uh, just a, a dear friend. And, you know, I talked to him a lot about Riders to the Stars. This is an early favorite of mine. And and uh, I led Three Lives. And he talked a lot about a lot of those people, Jack Webb. And, you know, I was just very fortunate that those people, you know, were still around. But there's a, a guy out there named um, Tom Cooper. And he owned a couple of revival theaters, the Vagabond, and then one went up there on the Sunset Strip. And he had a screening room, and I used to trade films with him when I, you know, from Kansas City. He was a film collector. And uh, I'd go up, when I'd come out there, uh, he had a screening room up there, and I'd always go up to watch movies. Then he had a guest house out back, and he said, well, you know, if you want to, just when you're out here doing your post-production, you know, you just come on and stay in the guest house. He says, I always have people here every night running you know, movies, and I mean, I met everybody up there from Catherine Grayson to to Ann Miller to Margaret O'Brien, and he used to date, actually, Liza Minnelli. I mean, there's Dick Hames was up there, just, you know, all all kinds of people that were in the business. He he knew everyone from the choreographer Hermes Pan, and, and I knew Alice Faye for many years, and I'd bring her up there and Mitza Gaynor, and and it was just a lot of fun back back then, you know, being out there with those people. And so he said, you know, I have a friend, um, my agent's an agent for Tom Neal Jr., and his father made a uh, 1945 film noir, real quick film, cheapy, named Detour, which he said, you know, you ought to remake that. That's just an excellent movie. And they said the female lead in it is just, I uh, never seen anything like her in the movies, so it was a very hard film to see. He had a kind of a not a very good VHS of it, and I watched it up there one afternoon, and I thought, you know, this could be made in Kansas City very cheaply. All of the uh, the uh, substantiating shots, you know, we'd come out to the Mojave Desert and shoot all the road scenes and all all the substantiating shots out you know, the apartments in L.A. and stuff in, in a day and shoot the rest of it on a soundstage back here that we had. So found out who owned the rights to it, and um, the company had gone broke and had been sold a couple times. So I went back to the original author of it, uh, Marty Goldsmith, who had also written The Narrow Margin, and looked him up, and so I bought the remake rights to do it again from Marty Goldsmith because it was from his novel. Uh, it was a very popular book back in the late 30s. And so Marty said, Wade, you're going to be surprised because when we made the film in 1945, they only filmed half of the story. They cut out a lot of it. And, um, I, I couldn't afford to hire him because he was with the Writers Guild. And the minimum to have him even look at a script was twenty thousand dollars. And he said, "You know, why why don't I just you and I just work out here in the afternoons, and we'll go through all this?" Because he said, "I'd like to see all the stuff that wasn't filmed back in in 1945 put in the movie." So I had a, a, quite an expert, you know, helping me, you know, put the film together. So. I met Tom Neal Jr. In fact, he looked exactly like his father, uh, and he was just about the same age as his dad was when they made Detour. So I made a deal with him. He he really didn't have a job. He was uh, working as a courier out there, I think, at the studios at the time, and so he was kind of skeptical coming back to Kansas. Does anybody live in Kansas? And yeah, you know, all of this stuff. So I, I told him, you know, you come back, I'll fly you back, you know, uh, we'll do some readings and, and you, you know, you can look at the soundstage and see if it's something you want to do. And well, he decided 
didn't have anything going out there. And so he came back here and we made the movie. He liked it so much. He had an apartment over by Corinth over in uh, about 83rd, uh, you know, off of state line. And he, he, uh, he just stayed in Kansas city. He, he died a year ago, of cancer, but had a, I think he was 58, but he, he stayed here. He really liked Kansas city. So anyway, going back, we made the film in 90 and without any major stars, I, I tried to get Ann Savage who was in the original detour to come and play a part that was not in the original movie. And I went out and I had lunch with her. She was, uh, uh, worked as an assistant to an attorney out in Beverly Hills. And I tried and tried and did my damnedest to, to convince her. And she almost said yes, but then Edgar Omer's wife, Shirley Omer and daughter Ariana said, you can't remake that movie. It's not going to be any good. It's, you know, uh, you're in the old one. You have incredible reviews. You know, I don't, and, and this, this guy doesn't know what he's doing. And yeah, you know, she could have been right. I don't know. But anyway, um, she wouldn't do it. So my friend Tom said, you know, uh, a lady I know real well that hasn't made a movie since the forties is Susanna Foster. And she starred in the original Phantom of the Opera and the climax back uh, during World War II. She was a, a coloratura, a wonderful star of Phantom of the Opera. So I said, well, you know, maybe I'll see. I, I wanted, I know, any kind of a name, an old name wouldn't matter, any kind of a name. And so I talked to Susanna, and she was scared to come back. And anyway, she did come back, and she was really wonderful in the movie. The only problem that that hindsight is is uh, is fifty fifty. I should have had her sing in the movie and should have changed her to a voice coach because I mean the lady could still sing beautifully and and it's just some things you regret that you didn't do. But she was the only Hollywood name I, I had in the film. I got I, I tried to get it in Sundance, they wouldn't take it. I tried to get it in one other festival and the only way to sell a film with no name stars, even though it had Tom Neal Jr., um, the only way to sell one is to get some great notices in some film festivals and go from there. Well, I, I got it in the Greater Miami Film Festival, and we all went down there, and we won first prize, went to the two top prizes in the festival. I thought, oh, wow, now maybe I'll sell this. You know, I was desperate to sell it and get a distributor. An agent came up to me from MCA and said, I, 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 you did a marvelous job with this film. It's really well made. He said, I thought it was made in the 40s. He said, you did such a great job. Uh, our, we would like to represent you. And so I said, great. I mean, you can't just go in Hollywood and get an agent. So uh, they represented me. Well, he then left MCA and he called me and he went over to the, the David Kirsch agency and he said, uh, you can stay here with another agent at MCA or you can come with me over to, to Gersh. So I stayed with him, I went over to, to David Gersh, which is a really fine agency out there and they st still, still represent me. So David Gersh came, said, Wade, um, a major producer in England wants the remake rights to Detour and would like to remake it with major stars and a big cast and director. What would you want for the rights to your movie? Now, it hadn't been released. It's only played at a couple of film festivals, and we premiered it in a fine arts theater here in Kansas City. And I had about 250000 in it. And I didn't have a sale on it. One company that became very big, they want to take the picture, and then if they make any money, they'll pay you. Well, I, you know, that's that doesn't work with me because I've been there before. Um, they make the money, and you don't get any any money back, and you have a very difficult time getting your negative. And then a lot of times they run up bills at a film lab 
you know, making trailers and stuff, and it, it put a lien on your property. So um, I, I, I didn't sell it. I, I, I didn't let this distributor take it. I said, okay, I'll take 250000 but I won't sell the film. I'll shelve it for seven years. I won't show it. And they can make a new version of it. But down, I said, I have a, a wonderful cast in this film. And a lot of people are going to be very disappointed. But, you know, I haven't sold it and I don't have it distributed. So I took the deal and they paid me the entire production costs and they never made the movie. They, I don't know what happened. They just didn't make the movie. So seven years later, I have a seven-year-old movie, The Remake of Detour. I had licenses out on my other films and just let it go. And so I'm going to put it out this year, hopefully or next year, on a double bill. I'm going to restore the 1945 Detour and put them out together, you know, on DVD and at least, you know, get some kind of... of play time out of it um that it's basically it's an odd story i i make money from the films but obviously not from showing it so i don't know what else i can say about detour i never like any films i've ever made except i do like detour i i had a leading lady who was beyond sensational as good as her, uh, Lee Lavish is her real name. She's from Kansas City. She's fantastic as Vera. And Tom Neal Jr. was just a just spitting image of his dad. And, and, you know, it was his first movie. He was pretty darn good in it. So you've got to look at that film with 1940s sensibilities because the dialogue's corny and it's going right back to the book. You know, it's Mickey Spillane type dialogue from that period so uh, it got good reviews and then mediocre reviews from from people the biggest problem the the negative reviews they didn't like it being remade and that's that's the same thing you have with invaders from mars i mean the remake is not a terrible movie and by any stretch of the imagination and uh, but when you start comparing them you know, with other films or an earlier remake that's got a great reputation, it's it's very very difficult to get great reviews. At least 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 get great.